Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Have You Ever Played podcast, the only podcast that has a two-year plus exclusivity deal with Epic Games. I'm Matt, aka Matt Fondude, and who are you? I'm James, aka James O Four E. And um, James, I, I just want to get right into the news. We, we've been trying to get a little more organized with our podcast. We we have a, a doc Jeez. of things to talk about, and I, I just immediately wanted to get into a news that is close to my heart. Kingdom Hearts series is finally coming to Steam after like many years of being Epic Games exclusive. The probably the longest Epic Game exclusive game series. One might say it was close to your Kingdom Heart. Yes, Kingdom Hearts is heart and li- Kingdom Hearts is light and there's darkness, etc. But um I don't know if you have any interest in Kingdom Hearts at all. Um <laughs> I I watched a lot of Kingdom Hearts parody videos as a kid, but I never actually played the game. I, I I would say it's probably a good time. You could actually play the games when they come out on Steam on June thirteenth. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't buy them at launch because they're mm-hmm. probably going to be full priced games. Um, Mayhaps. No, they definitely will be. Um, the fact that they are on Epic Games for like f- full price right now. I've, each game I think is the full price of when it came out. Um, yeah. And also, you could get it on PS4 like every game in like one collection for like twenty bucks. But um, yeah, no, I, I think it, it's just good that it's coming to Steam because uh, that means one, it might go on sale during a Steam sale, and mm-hmm. I'll probably I have them on Epic Games. I, I caved in because it was take. I, I really enjoy those games, and it took so long for it to come to Steam that I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna. I'll I'll buy them on a Steam sale for like five dollars at some point later on, um, mm-hmm. but now we have things like uh, proper Steam Deck support. Uh, I don't know, you're probably not familiar, but on the Steam Deck, Kingdom Hearts uh, notoriously is annoying to run in this collection because mm-hmm. um, it's on the Epic Games launcher, and you can get it to work, except the cutscenes don't work, and you need to like remove files to like remove the intro and outro cutscene because it's like mm-hmm. not supported. It's a whole thing, I, and I sh- they should be able to just work now. And those games would be phenomenal on the Steam Deck. Um, but yeah, it just kind of goes to show you though, like the Epic. Game- this one was the worst example, mm-hmm. but. Have you ever had a game come out and it like launch on Epic um, that just and then you just had to wait? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wasn't on I wasn't playing it on PC at the time, or actually, it's a big reason why I didn't play it on PC. But when Borderlands 3 came out, it was an Epic exclusive for like six months. And I think it was one of the first games to do that. And everybody was like so angry about it. It was crazy. Didn't we say on the podcast like recently, like, oh my god, this game is coming out? Or I said like, oh, this game is coming out, and you're like, wait, that's been out, but it was like Epic exclusive, and I just didn't know it was out for like months. Uh, it was some, it was some game that I said, I saw the Steam page, and I'm like, oh, it's lo- this game is coming out finally. Um, I can't remember what it was now, but yeah, I feel like Epic, like Kingdom Hearts was the one that broke me where I really wanted to play those games again and like having a PC port uh, after not having a PC port for, you know, years and years and years. Um, mm-hmm. I did cave and buy uh, one, the one, one in two collection, whatever, bundle. Uh, but then it took yeah. me, I, I bought three way, way later when it went on sale. Um, honestly, if I waited a couple more months, I could have just got three on Steam, but, you know. Um, yeah, I hate Epic Game exclusive games. It makes you not want to play them. Um, th- yeah, that's that. That's that section of the the news. Um, James, didn't yep. you want to talk about something? Yeah. Oh, well, that was I a horrible did. segue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I definitely had something to talk about. <laughs> um, yes, let me pull it up really quick. My something <laughs> is very important. Very, very I, important. I, I was going to try to say like, oh, there's... Because I know what you're going... I, I'm trying to transition you into your topic. <laughs> and I know what your topic is. But for some reason, my brain just couldn't think of a better segue. Because... Um, oh, so God. this this thing you're talking about, which you can introduce now, um, is just a white noise generator in my mind. Yes. There was a new Dota patch. It was a big <laughs> patch. 
<laughs> you can tell a Dota patch is a big patch because when you open the patch notes, it takes up a roughly plus 20% of your CPU. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, there's a that's at the top of the patch notes. There's like a um I guess it's like a gif of like gameplay of the new patch and it's showing a bunch uh-huh. of like the new stuff. Or it's a few gifs, it like rotates through them. And it it just it chugs, man. Like it absolutely chugs. What? And I look at my CPU usage, it just goes up by 20%. And when I scroll down, it goes back down. <laughs> That's wild. I, I mean, I'm looking at the GIF right now. It's like very high quality. And yeah. are you sure it's a GIF? It could. I, I would have to inspect the page. I don't know if video. it's. A, I don't know if it's a GIF. Maybe it's just a video with no sound. But e- well, e- either, either way, I don't know. It, 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 it's it's a thing. It's gameplay. Mm-hmm. Um. But anyway, yeah. So this patch was. It's weird because normally, right? These patches will change. Like like there will be a lot of individual big changes. Um, but this is one of those patches where they just kind of changed everything. Uh, like everybody got a little bit of like something and there aren't many, um, like non character related changes. Like they didn't change items too much, which is what also usually makes a pretty big impact with these patches. Um, but the main thing they did is that they gave every single hero an innate passive. Some characters already had one. So it's just like the ability would start at level one and they can level it up. And some characters, it's just like an, just an extra ability that they have. Uh, basically, we're, they want to be League of Legends. League of Legends hmm. time. Um, and then they also gave every character at least two facets, which are things that will kind of upgrade your character in some way. Some of them are just abilities the characters already had, but the other choice will be like a modification of the ability. So it's like you can go with the default that you've always known, or you can go with an alternative version like for example with wind ranger um her ultimate is just that she picks a target and she just attacks them really fast for a while and she can like move while attacking um or alternatively you can turn that ability into an effectively like an aoe where she fires a bunch of arrows really fast per second uh but you can only hit a, ca- a character like or a sing you can only hit a single character every three arrows so the idea is you're doing a bunch of damage to like a bunch of different people, but it's lower single target damage. So does this for someone who doesn't often play Dota, th- this seems like it adds more complexity to the game. Does it, do you think this makes it even harder to get into, like if you were just starting, or is it they they, so, they change things around? I think it's more of they change things. So from what I have seen, I like I've read all these facets and have played a couple games. I don't think, generally speaking, that they're, like, these big, like, cataclysmic things. That, like, oh, suddenly this hero is, like, gigabusted with this thing or, like, also gigabusted with this thing. And it's, like, what they choose is, like, unbelievably important. Like, it's important. Don't get me wrong. I think that some of these make... They make matchups less polarizing, which is, I think, the big thing that they wanted to do. Because one thing that I know drove away lots of new players... Is you know, you'd have a hero that you like, and you'd pick that hero, and then you get counterpicked, and it'd be really unfun. Um, because some counterpicks are really extreme. So these give a little bit more they give more dynamics, basically. And some of them are just really fun. Like uh Centaur War Runner, he has a thing where every two minutes he gets plus forty max HP. And he also has a facet where forty percent of his strength attribute gets converted into movement speed. Hmm. So he just doesn't need to buy boots. That's like really he, interesting. Yeah, actually. and he wants to stack strength anyway. So it's just like, it, it's not like, you're not really changing too much. Like, you're not buying boots, obviously, but you build the same items. It's just, you get this, like, little bonus now. So it, it doesn't fundamentally change what how you play the character as much. It's just more, both quality of life and efficiency. Yeah, you're right. It does kind of sound like... If you were getting stomped by, like you're saying, Dota does have a very specific, like this character is the hard counter to this other character. So mm-hmm. what you're saying is you can build, you can at least try to build your character more in a way to negate some of those shortcomings. Mm-hmm. Which that, that actually sounds very um, useful. But still, just uh, to, again, someone who is an outsider, it does seem a little more like, all right, there's another thing to think about. Uh, a bit but you know i i guess if if it's only like two what is it, like two options basically 
Um, yeah, to, it, to so it's from. two options for most characters. Some characters have more. Uh, so, like, for example, Chen. Chen's big thing is that he can control jungle creeps. Like, he can just click a creep and take control of it. Uh, and a problem that he had previously is that he was subject to the RNG of, like, random jungle creeps spawning. Uh, like, let's say you want a centaur creep, because the centaur creeps have, have a stun. So, like, you know, just... It's just nice to have a stun. If you want a centaur creep, you know, you're walking around looking for a centaur creep. Maybe you don't find one. Then one finally spawns and your teammate kills it. Oh. Right? So it can, be, it can be very frustrating sometimes. So what he has is he has five different facets. And each one allows him to select a creep that he can just spawn like on command. Mm -hmm. And so as you level up your skills, the creep will get better. And uh, these are all like big camp creeps. So... Big camps, they have one main big creep that's like the strongest one and then two smaller ones. So at lower levels, you'll spawn one of the smaller ones. And as you level up, you'll get one of the big ones. So it's not like you're just walking around with a big creep from level one into stomping your lane or something like that. Mm -hmm. So what is the general reception? Is it positive for the, the patch? And what do you think about it? I think the general reception has been positive. The only... <laughs> so it's funny because um, the only real issue that people have kind of had is that the patch was released in the middle of a tournament specifically right before the playoffs so like they played the group stage on one patch and then play off like literally i kid you not there was a, a day between the group stage and playoffs they released this patch on wednesday at like 8 p.m and the tournament's in europe hmm. so and the playoff games start like at noon for them so imagine waking up at like you know like 8 a.m or something like that you wake up oh hey new patch just dropped you have four hours to until you have to play i don't get why does this keep happening with games like wouldn't you think they would have some sort of build they're like all right this is this this is the tournament we're locking it to this build and and then you know like this happens well, a lot so there, there's a couple issues to that so first of all you have to maintain the build which i i know is expensive like mm -hmm. relative to what you would think um, it also creates a separation between competitive play and like ranked play and like casual play that mm -hmm. could potentially hurt viewership. Oh, well, I'm not saying permanently, but if there's already a tournament going on, like if there, because didn't this happen with, there's, there's a game this happened with where like they updated it like before the finals or something and everyone had to like learn. I think it was probably Overwatch because that sounds like an Overwatch thing to do. Yeah. So generally speaking, they have, they usually will do it at like the start of the playoffs if they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Um so like in in this case it it was right before the start of the playoffs. So from what I understand players are like <laughs> so it's funny cuz normally even like professional players are like hey guys hurry up and release a patch like it's been a while and then they release the patch during the tournament. So it's like mixed feelings. It's like on one hand damn we have to learn all this stuff and on the other hand you know it's a cool patch and we've been waiting for it for a while. And I also think that normally during tournaments, the meta will evolve anyway. So there is like a adaptation is very important in like competitive play. And there are some teams that will like learn patches very quickly because they have like some dude who just labs a bunch of stuff and he'll like read the patch and be like, oh, I'm just going to abuse this. So I, I think it, it while it can be kind of annoying and I it, and it's actually less like controversial than you would think, like most people are just happy and it's also fun to watch pro players not know what they're doing. Um, yeah, uh, as a viewer, I would love that just because it is yeah. like, yeah, learn. You better, you're pros, you learn. You know what I mean? It, it yeah. does seem a little weird, like if you were watching, it's just a very esports thing. It, it's like if you were watching like football or something, and it's like, oh, it's the big game. And uh, guess what? We're replacing the football with a frisbee now. Figure it out. But I guess yeah. that would be kind of hype if you were watching that. That would be pretty fucking hype. But yeah, yeah so it's, it's not as controversial as you would think. You know, it's, it's kind of like one of those things where people are annoyed, but also like, happy that's new patch so like kind of outweighs the annoyance mm -hmm. and you know also professional players they figure it out like they figure something out relatively quickly for the most part like well, you know you're, you'll read patch sounds... notes you'll see like hey this like looks pretty busted i'll just use it and they generally like kind of agree on stuff pretty quickly like you'll see they'll ban the very obviously busted stuff pretty early mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds very weirdly positive for a patch, you know what I mean? Not just for Dota, but like in, it feels like competitive patches and games and stuff like that are always very like controversial, usually. That, that seems like all like net good. Yeah. Yeah, and then also I think what's really cool about some of these things is that they enable new playstyles, which I know specifically Ice Frog is really big on. Uh, the 
the guy who made Dota Ice Frog, he's really big on uh, is like he wants characters to not only be viable in multiple roles, but with multiple builds and like play styles. Um, I'm trying to find an example really quick. Yeah, it does seem difficult to. So when I whenever I played and, and take this with your insult because I'm bad at these games. Mm-hmm. Whenever I played like a League of Legends or like a Dota <laughs> or even Smite, it, it felt kind of like there is maybe like three builds like to like for items to like build a character, but like there's one that's like this is probably the one you want to use, and then mm-hmm. add some items to like for the matchup. But yeah. To really have like, okay, I'm playing this character as like a tank and now I'm playing them as like a glass cannon seems kind of crazy to have that yeah, much difference. Yeah, in one it, it's not usually that extreme. It's more like normally this character is like a control mage, but with this facet, I can build them to do like more auto attack damage or something like that. Um, so like one example is Earthshaker. His big thing is that he has a lot of AoE stuns. He has a passive where every time he casts an ability, he stuns in an AoE around him. And he has an ability where he can slam his the totem he has on his back down, and his next attack does like a shit ton of extra damage. And so his two facets are one that makes his stunning passive increase by in radius by fifty with every ten levels, so it just makes you stun better effectively. Or he has one where whenever he kills a unit with his totem, uh, that unit that unit's dead body will go flying forward. And anybody that's hit hit with it will take 5% of the unit's max HP plus a flat amount of damage. So basically when you're laning against this character, if he uses his totem and kills a creep, the creep just goes flying at you and you just take damage from it. That's or cool. like or like later in the game, when one of your teammates like dies, they just their body their carcass just flies at you. <laughs> so the latter one is more of a like uh core slash like carry type thing or is the first one is more about like the stuns and utility for supports um so it, these are playstyles that already existed but it's like there's a there's a bit of a boon for like both playstyles that, yeah that, that that's that kind of reminds me in a, on a weirdly like not that similar but similar ish um wavelength of another valve game um team fortress 2 with mm-hmm. the how you have a class in the game and then there's kind of like a subclass like you can play like oh I'm playing I mean the most extreme one is demo man who's like oh I'm yeah. explosive or melee only but that's that's very extreme but like I'm thinking more like subtle differences like oh the spy like this knife does something slightly different I, I don't know that's kind of like a really bad take um but <laughs> I'm trying to relate it to things that I know yeah there are um, some there's some that are like really cool like um For example, Lion, his big thing is that he can drain people's mana like through a channel and his ultimate is called Finger of Death and it's just a big like single target damage ability. And so his choices are either that uh, whenever he drains mana, it deals damage equivalent to the mana drained to the enemies. Hmm. Um, Or whenever he casts Finger of Death, he turns into a melee character and gets a bunch of bonus damage based off of how many kills he's gotten with Finger of Death. And he, his melee attacks cleave. Okay. So, yeah, so maybe I wasn't that far off with my yeah. demo man take. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a little you... similar. So from from what I can tell, um, I don't necessarily think people are going to like suddenly start playing like carry Lion and like doing this. Because it's a pretty... It, it's not like a huge amount of time that you're playing that you're playing like as a melee and it's also like conditional on snowballing, but you know, it's, it's fun, right? Like you can do a goofy build with it or like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, like let, let, let's say like you just don't value the mana drain dealing damage thing very much. You know, you have like, you, you just have an alternate alternative option that you could potentially build around. And it's not like, it's not like you're losing a significant part of the character by picking this option, as long as you don't like didn't like plan on building around the other one. It's it's interesting to use the word fun and Dota in the same sentence. Yeah, um, <laughs> and this does actually sound like a fun update, and not just like like a oh god, the you can now you can like open a spreadsheet while you play the game and stuff. I don't know. 
Um, yeah, I think they've gotten a little bit better at appealing to to a more casual audience lately. They've been doing like lots of quality of life stuff. I mean, I don't think they need to because like Dota is it, like it. I don't think everything needs to be for me and casual people, or whatever. Like, it's cool that yeah. a game like Dota exists for the people who enjoy um, Dota. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I yeah, just thought I'm just of trying to just trying to see any other ones that are highlights. Um, I mean, there are some that are like again. There's also like more that's like one fun one and one that's like probably what people would play if they're trying to win. Um, mm-hmm. So like for Mars, his ultimate is that he can summon this giant arena that he can like pin people to with his spear, and it like blocks it blocks range attacks and projectiles, and it bumps people back in if they try to get out. So his two options are one that lets him basically every time he kills somebody inside of the arena, he heals a bunch of his max health and mana and he gets a damage buff for like 15 seconds or the other one, which is just no, nobody can see inside of or out of the arena. Like none of you, none of your enemies can. So if you trap somebody in the arena, their teammates just can't help them at all. It's a little bit of a Mauga alt from yes. <laughs> Overwatch 2. Yes, indeed. I don't yeah, know, so it's like kind of. Yeah, so it's like obviously vision is very important and being able to isolate somebody. It's very good for like if you're playing ranked or something. But, you know, if you're trying to have fun, you want to kill people in your arena and get a bunch of healing and do damage, then the other one's good, too. Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad we discussed the Dota patch TN. That actually sounds very yeah. substantial and yeah. uh, crazy. And do, do you know what is actually not very substantial and not crazy? What? Uh, the Nintendo uh, store, the Nintendo World store. Um, so <laughs> that was a much better segue. Thank you. Yeah, I was really trying. I was really trying this time. <laughs> um, I don't know why my brain just didn't work for the first one. Um, but anyway, speaking of people's brains who don't work, uh, the Nintendo store. Um, so the, the Nintendo, they're, they're actually uh, Nintendo announced that they are planning on opening a new nin- a Nintendo store location in San Francisco in Union mm-hmm. Square. Now, this is like the most kind of minor story, but I just I saw it and it just reminded me of my experiences with the current Nintendo store. I believe it's the Nintendo World Store or something. It's in New York City. It's in New York City. Um I'm looking it up right now, Nintendo World. I'm I'm just whatever. It's the Nintendo store in New York. Now, yeah. This store, uh, James, have, have you are you familiar with the the Nintendo store in New York City? Yes. Well, well, kind of familiar. I haven't been there since like elementary school. I I also have weirdly similar experiences with that. With that, of like, yes, like I I I've went there, but I was probably like ten. Yeah. Um. So yeah, basically. Now, the Nintendo store, if you've never been to it, it, it basically is just... It, it seems like it's going to be this crazy... It's like the Nintendo World store. Oh, my God. It's going to be this, like, the end-all, be-all experience. Like, this is... As, like, someone who played video games as a kid, it's like, this is where you need to go. Yeah, it's kind of it's um, like the Lego store. Yeah, but there's a, there's multiple Lego stores, though. Like, yeah. the, the, there was, like, one Nintendo store. And, um... Mm-hmm. Basically, I, I, I wanted to talk about this because... As a kid, there really wasn't that much gaming merchandise um, and like, you know, toys and things like that. Um, so it was actually cool to go to the Nintendo store. Now, now, here's the thing about the Nintendo store. It sounds like this crazy experience, but when you go there, it's like two store. It's like two levels and it's like this really, really tiny store that just kind of has like Mario T-shirts and I mean, there's some cool stuff in there. Like they have a uh, Game Boy that is supposed. I, 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 I guess the story is it was during a war. Someone had a Game Boy playing Tetris, and then it got bombed. But the Game Boy still works or something. I don't. I don't know. It, it looks like a, it's a fun little prop they have. Um, and when I went there, I believe they had like Mario. I think they had like Mario Mega Mix, like the DDR Mario on display, or like Pikmin or something. They had, they had like GameCube games. Like on mm. display, so it was kind of neat. Um, but it was literally just a store with like some T-shirts and stuff. But at the time, you really kind of couldn't get that stuff in a lot yeah. of places. Um, mm. so it was kind of nice because you could be like, "Oh my god!" Like Mario in the mainstream. But nowadays, 
You can get Mario like Legos and like Mario everything. Like you can get video game everything. Yeah, Mario's so, just everywhere now. It, now it's kind of like, what's the point of the store? It's really not that cool. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of lame. So, I was re- I read that I read I read that headline and and I read some of the article too, but. It, it was basically just like, oh, this new store is going to open. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure it'll be cool, I guess. But it's not like, unless they like spice it up and like add some activities or something like that. It's like, why wouldn't you, I mean, it's cool for a kid to go see it. But yeah. it's basically just go on Amazon or go to, tar- honestly, go to Target or like Walmart. And there's like a whole section that's the Nintendo store now. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically... Do you, how, so when you Nintendo went, do you have any fallen. memories? Do you have any? It's not, it's not fallen. It's just like, I think just it's weird to have a brick and mortar store now. Um, how that Nintendo sells like has thing. never gotten up. The, the ten, I think Nintendo is doing fine, to be honest. Um, how Nintendo. Uh, James, have you been to like the Disney store too? Like those places? Yeah, I've been to like sim- I, similar stores as, as a child. I used to mess with the Disney store. I haven't thought about yeah. that. I don't even know if they, I don't think they would really exist anymore. Yeah, I'm um, not sure. Now that malls are kind of dying, but for those who don't remember or weren't alive, they used to have, and I think they still do, that there was like in malls, a giant store that was like the Disney store and it was just all Disney stuff, but it was actually mm-hmm. themed really cool and it would have a ton of merchandise. Of course, all of it would be Disney prices and cost $20 billion, but... Yeah. It was cool to walk in. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing with like the Rainforest Cafe. I don't know. Themed. We don't really have themed locations anymore. You know? Yeah. Uh, I guess just escape rooms. You know? that That's kind of the new themed thing. Mm-hmm. James, you ever done done an escape room? Um, I think I did like once. It's, it's been a while. Not your vibe? Um... I mean, I wouldn't even necessarily say that. It's kind of, it's kind of, just kind of don't do it, you know. I don't know. Like, I, I don't I was, know if there's, if there's any that are like super close to where I live, but I was kind of afraid to do an escape room at first because I thought like I would be really embarrassed if I got stuck on the puzzle. Because if mm-hmm. anyone's watched me play um, any puzzle game on stream, I'll get stuck on a puzzle for like an hour, yeah. and I, I, then you know I thought that would be kind of embarrassing, but. I didn't realize you, you basically go to those with like eight people. Like you go to those with like a huge group. So you'll figure it out. And they're really not that hard of puzzles yeah. for the most part. Um, I mean, there's probably there's varying levels of difficulty for different escape rooms. But mm-hmm. yeah, that, that's kind of fun. That's like a themed thing. We don't really have a lot of like themed stores. And I don't know. I kind of miss malls a little bit. Yeah, malls really fell off. I, they well to be fair i'm doing all my shopping online basically but it's nice to yeah. walk around a mall um, especially outdoor malls yeah outdoor malls, outdoor are, cool malls are really fun like i remember when i went to um what was it was it San, it might have been it was either san an outdoor francisco mall or, it was either san francisco or, or disney but like i i went to an outdoor mall at one of those places when i was at one of those places and it was like the vibe was Im- immaculate mm-hmm you get some fountains it's very out there, chill. like outdoor malls in like the spring or, or the summer, or just their their peak. I kind of am, I'm an indoor mauler. Um, I mean, I like an outdoor mall for actually shopping, for like legitimately going shopping, and like the vibes yeah. are better. But the nostalgia and the like, I also kind of like the indoor vibe of a mall. I like the small stores and yeah, but I think they're like all kind it, of gross and bad now. Yeah, it's weird because like outdoor malls feel like um. God, it, it, they feel like those memes where it's like people are talking about how life used to feel so much better and it's like people driving around or something like in the <laughs> summer and there's like palm trees and stuff like oh, oh. That, that's what outdoor malls feel like. But indoor malls are like like childhood. Are you talking about those like also the memes where it's like this guy used to look like this and it's like really blue and now it's like now it looks like this it's like desaturated blue. It's like, yeah, yeah, um, yeah like stuff like that. Yeah, I I, uh, I probably spend too much time watching like shorts that are like nostalgia bait shorts where it's just like yeah, just like vaporwave music set to just pictures of 
90s and 2000s can, things. And I, I think the crazy thing is, I can't tell if this, like, uptick in nostalgia, I can't tell if it's because people are getting older or because of COVID. Like, uh, like if COVID I, hypothetically both. didn't... Uh, yeah, I think it's probably both. But, like, hypothetically, if COVID didn't happen, like, how deep in this will we be relative well, to, like, where we are now? When COVID happened, everyone suddenly decided... Everyone who was uninteresting and didn't have any hobbies was like, oh, no, I have to, like, sit inside. <laughs> so everyone kind of was, was like... It was a gamer's I, dream. No, it wasn't just gaming. It, it was, like, people who didn't have any hobbies needed to find something to do. Because yeah. um, a, a lot of people like to go out, and that could be, like, a hobby of, like, you know, going out and doing something. Or, like, if you, yeah. if you wanted to... If you, like, karaoke or if you like dancing or something. Like, you had to find something else to do. So video game collection... Like, anything that was collectible skyrocketed in price um yeah. like records video games and none of that has recovered yep um, since covid the video game industry is definitely not recovered oh well not just very, new video games very, i'm talking about like not retro good. collector games like no, you can't buy any like you could go buy a wii now for like 200 bucks like what the yeah. like what honestly like all tech is kind of not recovered yeah like tech the tech industry is really fucked you know what's funny to think about People who bought the Apple Vision Pro, like, and where they R &R. are, like, right now. R and R. I, I mean, that technology is pretty awesome, and I will buy it eventually when it's better. This was not the time to buy. You do, like, it's like the first generation iPad. Like, that was not the time to buy. You gotta wait like yeah. till the fourth one or something. You gotta wait. Gotta um, I will say though. Bit. I will say. Um, do you know what came out? Uh, right out the gate and was a banger what smiling friends season one. Ooh, indeed. yeah that was a banger so um smiling friends season two has been slow drip airing right now and um yeah. i know we, we talked about this a little bit before the podcast so we both have seen it mm -hmm. and um so we're on, I, I think for the people listening, uh, what, what, uh, there's only like three episodes out right now for Smiling Friends, I, I think, think only, right? Actually, no, it, it is three. So how they did it is, I believe, the first episode, the Gwimbley episode, mm -hmm. uh, it got like released early as like an April Fool's thing, I think. Mm -hmm. um, they yeah, kind of it pretend, was way earlier, yeah. <laughs> they did that whole thing where they like pretended that it never got released or something. <laughs> Then, um, then when it premiered, I think it's been like two weeks now. Like it was May twelfth that it premiered. Um, when it premiered, they had a new episode. Then they had the Gwimbley episode after, because Smiling Friends episodes are like twelve minutes or something. Yeah, they're like eleven. Uh, yeah, eleven, twelve, something like that. And so, yeah, the the <laughs> God, the other episode, the, like the non Gwimbley episode, the president one. Good lord. <laughs> Like, yeah, I, I, I don't know how they do it, honestly. Like, it, it it might be the funniest show on TV right now. Okay, interesting opinions on this, because I have been reading... So, one, I think the Gwimbley... The first episode is fantastic. Like, it, yeah. it actually sprung up a bunch of memes immediately. Uh, it's how I found out the show was even back on air, is because I mm -hmm. kept seeing that character green screened into, like, every piece of media. Yeah. um, Pretty genius. Also, by the way, if you haven't seen the uncensored version of the Wembley episode, it, it it is phenomenal. <laughs> like when he says the part where he says "Oh fuck you," <laughs> the fuck <laughs> is so like pixelated. It's so funny. Yeah. So, um, season two really opened with a bang. I think everyone was really excited about it. Um, episode two and three. So episode two aired uh and i watched episode two i thought it was pretty good uh, i liked yeah. them uh, they, they, they've been doing a lot of mixed media they, they did this in the first season as well yeah um it's like but the, also in the it's like the show's like specialty i would say is the various animation styles and like some mixed media in general yeah and and it's also fun to watch the show and and it's really rewatchable because if you just like look in mm -hmm. the background there's so many hidden easter eggs yeah and, and also like I, I like the little details that they do too like um something that was pointed out to me recently is whenever a character gets like pointed at you know like when they make like the finger really big that's pointing at them like they <laughs> emphasize it apparently every time a character gets pointed at they like flinch back <laughs> uh, and then um, um <laughs> and i think for the most recent episode, there was also a detail where it was like the two main characters they leave, and there's just like a single frame of them like kissing as they're leaving, like just <laughs> randomly. There, so 
yeah, all the, the show is great. The, the show is like really good. I think airing it every one episode like a week is kind of a tough. I just don't particularly yeah. like that style. So of yeah, I'm I'm like conflicted because I I do understand like whenever I whenever I watch it like you know I'm always excited like you know it's midnight oh smiling friends episode time midnight on a Sunday, and then it's like I watch the first half I'm like oh it's like over. Yeah, uh, it's a little sad, but I also think if they if it so the season is eight episodes, so if they were to air two episodes a week, and it were only four weeks, I would be kind of sad when it's over. I get it. I think. Well, the way I experienced season one, I think the way a lot of people experienced season one is pretty much all the episodes were available. Yeah, and most people just binge it. You could just binge it. And I think that was a better experience with this show because it's it's like, yeah, you're right. They're like 11 minutes or yeah, 12 minutes, 11 minute episodes. You're watching it and then you're like, all right, well, it's over. I want to watch the next one. I'm like, and then it yeah. kind of makes anything that doesn't work as well. It, it it sticks with you more because you're like, well, that was this week's episode. So, um, I, I've been reading some Reddit discussions about each episode and episode two, people seem to not like as much. They, they thought it was kind of like, you know, derivative of what they've done before. Yeah. And I, I, I could see why, why people wouldn't necessarily like episode two as much as the other ones. I think it was, they're definitely going for something a little different. It was like, I would actually argue it was a little too normal. <laughs> Cause mm-hmm. like with the whole like worms controlling the world and like conspiracy theories, like people think that anyway. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I think the general idea was like, they were making fun of those people while also like making it reality. And like it, they were showing how stupid it would be if that was actually happening. <laughs> I, I um, think a- another issue people have is there's a lot of recurring characters that were side characters, yeah. like almost maybe too many right at the at the bat. Like every character is just well. There's a lot of characters that are one off joke characters from season one that just are in the episodes, and it's like, well, that could have been a new yeah. character, maybe. Like I think um, DJ Spit and uh, Mr. Frog. Mr. Frog. I think the Mr. Frog one was weird. Because he becomes president, but I don't know what the implications of that actually are, and I feel like it's never going to be mentioned again. Mm-hmm. It's very odd. I feel like it was like a character that's kind of, you know, like no, I, I thought he it, didn't become president because he eats the bug. Or no, wait, didn't he? Because no, there was no, no, a glitch. No, no, no. I don't remember. Yeah, 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 no, he he became president at the end, I believe. But I think my thing is, I think Mister Frog works as a character that's like it. it it's fine to always know that he exists. Like, you know, if he's in the background of an episode or something, it'd be pretty funny. But I think like making him the center of an episode again, even though he wasn't like super prominent, like he was just kind of there for the most part, making the center of the episode of an episode again. I didn't, I guess I could see why people wouldn't like as much. I wasn't a huge fan of it either. I actually would have preferred if they kept the other, the other guy, I think it was squiggly Miggly. Mm -hmm. I think he was funny. He, He had potential. I think it, it's just like the growing pains of season two of a show like this. Like, I, I feel like probably, people probably felt similar ways to like Rick and Morty, I guess, where it's like, oh, season one, quotable, quotable. Oh my God. It's like, nothing is like this. And now how do you continue it in a way where it's like, okay, well, they're going to continue the storylines. Now we're like familiar with some of the characters. Like we're really familiar with the main cast and um, they, they can't really do the same kind of jokes again. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's just the the way the show is, the humor of the show being a lot of like kind of like randomness and stuff like that. Maybe it's just because yeah. now there's even more of it. Um, it's becoming more relevant. Yeah. Also, so, uh, yeah. So to be fair, though, I do think that episode three was like a definitely a, a pretty big step up. Like, I, I think the the style of humor was a lot more more on brand for them. And it also had like, it, it referenced things from previous places that weren't like too on the nose. Like I think the whole paperclip thing with Alan, like I remember there was the, those like little monsters that were inside of the walls and they like stabbed him with paper clips. And it was like a very mm-hmm. subtle reference to that. Um, Yeah, I think that was cool. I, I wasn't too crazy about, uh, again, like they brought back DJ spit. Wasn't too yeah, crazy I- about that. I didn't he died, was... so like it was. It was like 
Yeah, like I, I guess that should have okay. probably been a new character. Like, that yeah, was, like, I, feel, a weird... I feel like the whole idea was like he's going through all these random like crazy ad- adventures to get some paper clips. Like, I get that, and I also <laughs> the crime filled thing was pretty funny, but um, mm-hmm. I do think it would have been a little more impactful if they introduced a new character and just had him do the exact same stuff. But uh, but besides that, the new characters in that episode were very good. Like his landlord was very funny. Mm-hmm. Like the whole yeah. The whole smoking weed, drinking Diet <laughs> Coke, and playing Burnout, Burnout for the P- or Burnout Two for the PS2, or was it Burnout Revenge? I, I don't remember. Burnout, I don't know. One of the Burnout games for PS2. Yeah, that Anyways. that was a good app. Um, I think the biggest thing is um, I'm gonna look at season one right now. I, I think because you could binge, you could binge the entirety of season one right you could binge the whole thing so any mm-hmm. episode that might have been like eh whatever like that was okay like anything like any moment like that you would forget about and then you just yeah. remember the good like all the good stuff like i'm looking at like the shrimp episode i mean that was probably okay but like you know so it's like you remember a lot but you remember the the impactful episodes and impactful moments so actually now that i think about it i think the shrimp episode was like pretty good though i, I don't think all, it the, was all of the episodes in season one were good yeah. it's just there were some that were less good so i think that like relative to the other episodes there were definitely some less good ones but i think that i don't know if i would say the present it, it, it feels bad to say because all the episodes are like very good but i th- i think i would say the president episode was probably the worst one I mean, but, there's only three out right now, too. But no, so. I mean, but, like of the whole, of like the whole series. Yeah, I, yeah, it, it's weird because it's still like a, a great episode. Like if you put it in like most other other shows, it'd be one, definitely one of the better ones. So, but I think <laughs> I, I guess it's more that if you were to binge that the season, that one would be relatively like not skippable, but it would definitely be like a, a more noticeable low point than anything in season one. Mm-hmm. Um. I, I know that we have a dock of stuff, but we're talking about low points in television shows. Uh, I think I think we oh, could briefly yeah. talk about <laughs> House of the Dragon season two um, and Game of Thrones mm-hmm. as a whole. I, I think we could just yeah. briefly talk about it. Maybe try not to give too many spoilers of Game of Thrones, I guess. But yeah. like, I guess one um, thing that I did notice is like lots of people are there's lots of Game of Thrones ending discourse on on Twitter again. I don't remember why, but like people were like talking about like, I, I think I saw the tweet. I was basically saying, have you guys ever looked back on that whole Game of Thrones anything and thought about how fucking funny that was? Because like, yeah, so the big rumor going around was that um, the the directors, they like ended it because they wanted to work on their Star Wars project. Then the Star Wars project got canceled. Well, they got removed from the Star Wars project because they bumbled it. Yeah, um, and then I also saw some people saying I saw one tweet. It was like you know, it was really nice of those guys to take the hit for what was very obviously George R. R. Martin's ending. And everybody was like, "Like, what <laughs> are you talking about?" Okay, and then, and then they were like going on the conspiracy theories, like that's why he isn't releasing more books. He saw people didn't like the ending, and he thinks he's a fraud. So, so here's the deal with that. I I was also firmly in the camp, man. These like. David Benioff and Weiss or whatever those people man they suck um but now they have the show three body problem which I know nothing about but apparently people really like it and I believe they're adapting it from like media and you know Mm -hmm. what they did they did the parts of Game of Thrones that people liked they adapted it well it really kind of is George's fault in a way well I don't know that no one thought it would be as successful as it was gonna be and like it, it the real problem was the, the source material wasn't done yeah. and i don't think anyone really could have predicted how popular it would become and just like it, it just sucked that it sucks that it it had to suck so but maybe i actually day, think i think what's it. so crazy is that if it were less of a cultural phenomena they could have like taken a bit of a break and been like okay mm-hmm. you know george you know we need we really need this next book like within the next like three years so we aren't like well, doing a whole like five year break or something it's also hard as someone who's like a creative or whatever. It's hard. Yeah. He's clearly in a slump and doesn't yeah, want definitely. to write Game of Thrones. Yeah, and it's a hard thing to write. Um, so it's yeah, hard to be like, "Oh, you him- be creative on time every year, make a new book." It's like, it's just, it just sucks. It just, it just the whole situation sucks, you know. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, I think what's also a little funny about it is, um, 
So I know there are some, there are a few like manga in Japan that are very like notoriously on hiatus because the author just like lost interest or something like a uh, like Vagabond, for example. Well, like, and um, they could also be just like dying because like yeah, that like, that too, his... that too, like like Hunter Hunter. But I, I think much. it was funny that um, George R. R. Martin, while he's on his like whole, like I, I guess you could call it a Game of Thrones hiatus, he works on a Souls game. <laughs> Well, and, and, so, like and what's particularly spin-offs. funny about that is that, um, as many of you know, the Souls games are very heavily influenced by Berserk, which was also a manga that. So the hiatuses were both because of health and also because of, um, I, from what I understand, the creator kind of fell out of love with the story for a bit. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of it's, it is kind of funny. It's a little bit of a similar situation um, where he's working on a on a story that was influenced by a story that's kind of like his. I don't know, like, when you, uh, the, the, the biggest problem is, right, it's just, it's such an undertaking, and it became too popular, mm. and now everyone has expectations, like, he, he cannot make it in a bubble, you know, and now also, if that was his planned ending, and everyone hated it, um, now he has to, I feel like he probably feels like he has to change everything, yeah. too, um, I don't, I don't know, but we're talking about House of the Dragon, which is the uh prequel show to game of thrones about a bunch of targaryen people doing stuff um season one was very acceptable it was good i i mean there was some dumb stuff in it Mm -hmm. uh there's a scene where uh where um doctor who is running away from a million arrows and uh none of the arrows hit him (laughs) And that was a little, yeah. like, late Game of Thrones-esque action. You know, honestly, um, I gotta say, Matt Smith, as an actor, like, he's a great actor. He's just very, like, distracting. He's a, He, like, sticks out a lot. <laughs> well, like, I, like, I don't know no how to describe it. kind of thing. Yeah, like, they don't, like, like his chin is just very, very well, def- his, his jawline is just very well-defined. I, I, no, he's great. Honestly, he's great in House of the Dragon. I, I think everyone does a pretty good job in House of the Dragon. You know what? Actually, um, speaking of one. actors with well-defined jawlines, you know what I realized? Apparently, uh, th- this was very odd to me because I never thought of him like this. But like Timothy Chalamet, really well-defined jawline. I like never noticed because he's a very like skinny dude. He's just like he looks like a twig. But <laughs> you know, like so- somebody showed me like a pi- like a video talking about like ha- like how his like face is very like conventionally attractive. Like oh, it's like yeah, he does kind of have like a a well-defined jawline. It's really weird. <laughs> now that feels I, like I it feels like it doesn't fit that, like no. the rest of his the rest of his like body. You're Very right. Odd. It really doesn't. <laughs> but well, but yeah, he he's much less less distracting to my brain though than than Matt Smith. Ma- well, yeah, Matt Smith has a very distinct face, which um, yeah. it, I think works for the character. Or whatever, it gives him like a vibe, and I think Matt Smith's really good uh, as an actor in this. Um, but. Oh, yeah, so House of the Dragon, while well, well, James is away, um, House of the Dragon season one, I think it was like pretty much an apology. Like House of the Dragon was pretty much an apology for the ending of Game of Thrones. And we're like, okay, we can't mess this up because we will ruin the entire franchise and no one will ever want to have any sort of contact with any Game of Thrones things. Um, and I think they did a good job of making it watchable and um, actually having people, you know, want to be able to view it. All right, we're back. We had a little temporary break, but we were talking about House of the Dragon season Jeez. two and how it was kind of an apology for Game of Thrones. and Or at least it had to be good. Otherwise, yeah. their entire franchise would be destroyed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. And, I'm actually not sure what they're gonna do after that, or after this. Uh, for like the sh- for shows or for the season. Uh, just for shows because they have like the they have the Duncan Egg thing, and then they have the rest of House of Dragons. But then it's like, I don't know. I feel like they I feel like they're gonna have to start making stuff up at some point, and we're gonna go back into the Dark Ages, like when like when Game of Thrones ended, and they just put out bad stuff. Well, I'm looking at there's a bunch of I'm looking at a a, a list right now, mm-hmm. um on screenrant.com which I've, if, I've never heard of this website before oh, but, um, no, I'm, I'm kidding I know I know what screen rant is oh man um anyway a 
I'm looking at an article where it's saying House of the Dragon is confirmed, obviously, see they're on season two. A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms, which is the Hedge Knight, confirmed. Aegon's Conquest is confirmed, so there's going to be an Aegon show. I don't, I've don't. i never even heard any info about that, but I guess it's confirmed according to this article. I, I, I don't know. Take that with a grain of salt. Then there's like the Golden Empire, the Sea Snake, and 10,000 ships in development. But there was also the, the Jon Snow show that was in development that got canceled, because yeah. why would they think that was a good idea? Oh, um, man. Because Jon Snow I, was popular. I, Kid Harrington like and like Jon Snow. Snow was... He was cool, but it's just like, how? What are you gonna do? Like, wh- how would you even make a Jon Snow show? And I guess the answer was don't, because it would be bad. Um, yeah, I I feel like God when when I see when I hear like all these shows are like in production, I'm getting, I'm getting like MCU vibes. I know, yeah, definitely getting Disney Plus MCU vibes. It, it just just Star Wars, yeah. Just make everything. Just do everything. You know. Um, I yeah. I, I mean, House of the Dragon season one was uh, pretty watchable. And the best part about it was watching the Alt X Shift videos on YouTube, which is a YouTuber who just like talks about Game of Thrones for like ten hours on each episode. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like you basically had an episode and then your own little podcast after. So there's it was fun yeah. to discuss. Like that's the best part of these shows. You can discuss them with your friends. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just thinking it's a really good time for like think pieces on a uh, on on like media in general. Like you know, all the people that talk about like. Oh, uh, like why Star Wars has gone downhill, and it's like I, I saw this like really long Twitter thread. Is this guy explaining like, yeah, you know, Star Wars was actually made for kids, and we're not kids anymore, but they're still trying to appeal to us. That's the problem. And I was well, like, well, I think the problem is they struck. They, they basically got lucky with Star Wars, and it was a simple story, and now it's just like you need to know, like, where was Princess Leia? when she since from the timeline when she was born to the events until she died where was luke when he was two years old oh, wait yeah. he was walking by um obi-wan like he was there he was there he saw obi-wan make the lightsaber like yeah. it's just like i, I actually the think the lore things. is too the lore is too rigid to the point where i think they need to make like admittedly non-canon stuff mm-hmm. like, well that was some fun, of the like, cool stuff like the expanded universe thing some yeah. they had some cool stuff but like um like that new uh old republic show they're making that looks pretty cool um mm-hmm. but one thing that i also saw people talking about was that um star wars is one of those franchises where the big the money maker is the toys and yeah i think people were saying that like even though even though stuff like rogue one and andor were successful nobody's buying an andor toy <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but it, it was like, it, God, the thread was really funny. I can't like properly convey it, but yeah, it it, it was really interesting because it like got me thinking like, damn, you know, we're re- maybe, maybe this old Republic thing is like actually the best thing that they could possibly do because there's a bunch of new characters that could probably sell toys, especially with like that lightsaber whip guy. And, you know, it's also an era that people are interested in because it doesn't have enough canon stuff. I think if it's successful, like Mandalorian, if it's successful, if it's somehow a success despite the meddling of the terrible studio and whatever, if it is somehow a success, they will ruin it in the next, the, pre- the following seasons and then spin it off 15 ways. No, no, you know, I, think, I have no hope for yeah, anything. Like Now I'm thinking about it. It's very odd that they tried to do so many Star Wars things like between the, the prequels and the original trilogy because I think that is the worst time frame to work with in all of Star Wars. <laughs> like easily it is, it is the worst like first people of all, like the prequels first of all, people like first them of all, we have this whole thing where it's like oh you know a surprising amount of jedi like escaped order 66 don't you all think that's a little odd <laughs> it's, and then this fact that like you can't do anything with these characters because they like have canonical points where they're, they're supposed to like meet people and canonically they're literally doing like nothing like actually nothing like farming for the <laughs> for like their entire lives so you can't just make them do something so the and if problem, you do, people will get mad because it directly contradicts the canon. Like the, the other problem just is, give it up. It's, Go do a new era. Is, Stop it. It's it's this massive universe of all these different planets and aliens and different things, and but everything revolves around like ten people. Yeah, and it, it's just like everything Very ties odd. back to like the like a handful of people for the entirety like, I of think, the world. I think um, it's actually quite interesting. I haven't like read all of like. I've only read, for, so for Dune, I've only read the original book, and I'm, like, starting to read the second one. But, like, from what I understand, they actually just, 
say, say like fucking and they just start doing like new stuff after like the second book and like they focus on new like new characters they go into like the deeper lore of things and they're less concerned with like the like whole chosen one narrative and i think like star wars should just do that they but they can't they 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 did with mandalorian they did and that's why it was so successful it's, but they yeah. can't they have to tie it in it has to be like they just cannot not have like oh my god look there's the millennium falcon it's just like everything has to somehow tie in that reminds me of that like george lucas like uh interview or whatever he's where he was like where he said like it's like poetry it rhymes yeah they can't like they literally just can't they can't have it be its own thing it has to have some sort of reference it's just they can't it's impossible man um anyway just to end, let's let's talk about House of the Dragon again for another second because we got on a Star Wars tangent. Uh, yeah. I'm just it's it's June fifteenth, the first episode. I'm excited. I think it'll be nice. Mm-hmm. I don't think it like. Do you think how many seasons do you think it'll take for them to ruin it? Is is a question. I I think it's only got like one or two more before it's before it starts to get cooked. I mean I don't know how much they have to adapt. So like, I, I, who knows? I hope they just go quick. Just like like if, give us four seasons that are good and then just is end the it. original story done. It's not like really a story. It's like a bunch Actually, yeah, of Yeah, yeah, I remember now. It was like a it was like lore books. Yeah, it, like they're just loosely it, yeah. adapting from lore books and stuff. They have like a timeline. Yeah, but yeah, I like think... it's like the the lore book just says like this guy did this thing at this time and they're like, "Okay, we can do like we can make this like two episodes." I mean, at least what's good about it is like it has to be good. Like it has to do well because then yeah. it, like it, the whole franchise is riding on this. So I think it'll at least be passable. I think they should well, four seasons so, end so it or something. Would, so you would think, but you would also argue that the final season of Game of Thrones had to be you could argue okay. it had to be good. I think they coast it on its success and we're like, "Ah, eh, people will watch any slop we throw on there." Slop. And it's like the back the <laughs> backlash was the backlash was so bad. That it was, you would go to a store, any store or any party, and you would see someone with like Targaryen, uh, House Targaryen socks. Like you'd see people with like shot glasses, scarves, whatever. Not, and then after that finale, nothing. Ever, just oh, you. Would, I have never. I haven't seen a Game of Thrones piece of merchandise like anywhere. It's just no one cares. Like it, it was like up there with Harry Potter, where like you had the houses for Harry Potter. Like that's always yeah. m- crazy merch. It was that level of merch, and now just no one cares. God, I, I was crazy. just thinking the word slop is, is so fu- it's so hilarious to me because <laughs> every time I see like a trailer of something on like Twitter, the repository of love, oh, more slop. <laughs> it's another piece of Marvel slop. <laughs> James, I don't know. Are you are you busy right now? Uh, can we make a can we do like an extended pod for like a little bit? Because we, we've been slacking a bit on our pod. And sure. I got more to talk about. I got more to yell about. More to yell about. Yeah, we're gonna more we're gonna to we're gonna have about. a special. Yeah, we're gonna yap some more on our extended pod today. I think we should just go through the whole docket, just because sure. we're you know. Um. Yeah. So, do you have any final thoughts on House of the Dragon? I mean, we didn't really even talk about the show at all. Just my final thoughts it. are that it's just more more slop, more, more game slop. of Thrones slop. But this is season slop. This is good. This is, this is slop with a side of like barbecue season, sauce. More or something. seasonal slop. <laughs> it's gonna be slop that I'll consume happily until it becomes bad slop. <clears throat> um, speaking of games that are slop or things that are slop, do you want to talk about the next subject? Yes, Apex Legends. They had a new <laughs> season a few weeks ago. Mmm, <laughs> content slop. Oh man, yeah, more more Apex Legends slop. <laughs> um yeah uh funnily enough this is one of these seasons that uh some people consider more slop than others <laughs> so they released a new character it was really it's a really weird character um so basically what she does her passive lets her she can like loot one item from a death box from like far away which is okay, like okay cool it's kind of kind of you can get some useful stuff out of it sounds it's, really it's annoying not, yeah, it's non non combat uh, stuff, so it's like, yeah, it's just okay. Um, and then her like tactical ability is that she can make a portal that just goes through a wall. Okay. Um, and then her ultimate is that she can make like a, a what's referred to as a regroup point. And how it works is that her al- her and her allies can look at it, 
And if you hold down interact, uh, after like three seconds, you'll teleport back to the point and you'll leave like a portal that other people can follow. Oh, like Diablo. Kind of, yeah. Uh, and and you can use this while knocked. So, yeah, this <laughs> oh! So, yeah, this character is very weird. I mean, one thing it's like is... like Life Weaver. Just weird utility. Yeah, one thing is the ultimate is kind of is pretty bad, generally speaking. It's like it, three seconds is a really long time. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it takes really long to actually go back to the alt. It's also just it, it's weird because you need a safe spot to go back to, and you can't guarantee like if you're all if you're all like if you're popping the alt and you're all like pushing something, you can't guarantee the spot you're going back to is safe because like people could just walk up there. Then the tactical is like it's cool. You can like go through walls and stuff, but I think there's like a limited number of buildings where that's actually useful. It's more like it's nice, like it'll get you to where you want to get to faster. But it's like it's a typical apex problem of you know you can just play better and you're mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't really need the character. So my hard read on the situation this sounds to me like as someone who doesn't play apex, this sounds to me like the life weaver in Overwatch, in which yeah. they introduce a character with a ton of utility. That's like they expect people to use the utility in smart ways. And like they're like, oh, pros will use all these utility moves and whatever. And no, the pro players just play the characters that do the shoot good and like are just easy good. Like characters that are just good and they don't need all this weird like niche yeah. utility. And then bad players play the utility character because they're like, oh, I'm going to be a pro. But then they play and use the utility wrong and they're terrible and they yeah. like, ruin the game. Yeah, the character also has a lot of trouble fighting in, like, open space, which honestly is a lot of the game. Mm -hmm. Especially on, like, most like on most of the maps. There's one map that, that's more buildings, but that's, like, more, more the exception than the rule. So, yeah, it's kind of an odd character. I don't, I don't even know how that would really buff it, because it doesn't, like... None of these things are, like, stats. Yeah, that's it's the thing like, about... He, he, he does a we thing... You yeah. can't buff utility. You just buff the number. You just juice the numbers and yeah. everything else. And then it's like, it doesn't work. You can't balance that character. Yeah. Like you can't make I also them think the problem is that like, there's no numbers to really juice on this yeah, character. I guess in Apex specifically too. Yeah. It's all yeah. like, you're, you're at least in Overwatch, it's, oh, you can make the healing more. You can make the damage more. Like you can't really yeah. do that. It's because it's guns, right? Like it's the, the items or the stats mm -hmm. pretty much. Mm hmm. Yeah. So well, that sucks. <laughs> Yeah. Then another one of the major things of the season is they added this thing called an Apex called Apex Artifacts. And so um most people I think know about heirlooms in Apex. They're like melee weapons that just replace your fists and they just look uh -huh. cool and you can spin them and stuff like that. And cost like three hundred dollars. Yeah, it's you are guaranteed to get one one you're guaranteed to get one every five hundred Apex packs, or it has like a one hundred five hundred chance effectively. Um and like each Apex pack is a dollar, so it's five hundred dollars. <laughs> if you want to like guarantee it, oh my um, god! But what's weird is you can't open the packs in bulk. So like if if like let's say I start playing Apex and it's like oh I'm like a, a rich guy I want to get an heirloom now. It's like I have to open 500 Apex packs one by one. You want your slop? You got to open it one by one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know you got to get through all the slop. You got to play in the muck thing. to get your slop. Yep. Um. But so the big selling point with this Apex artifact thing it's it's an heirloom, but it can be equipped on any character. Kind of like the Final Fantasy sword. Um, and it's it's supposed to be customizable. So the idea is that there's the base, uh, like, heirloom. And then with a new currency called Exotic Shards, you can buy more customizations for it. And it's each customization is 10 Exotic Shards, and 10 Exotic Shards is $10. Uh, and there are... Let me see. One, two, three, four... There are 20 different customizations, effectively. And when, and so there's 20 different customizations, there's four different slots. Um, and there's, so there's a theme slot, which will just change the general, like, uh, like color and like pattern of your, of your artifact. Then there's the power source, which will change like the light that's coming out of it. So, you know, everything needs fancy LED lights now. Of course. And there's the, the activation emote, which is, uh, I actually don't know what this is. I believe what it what happens is when you first take it out, you do like a little like, I don't know, you like lift it up and it powers up or something like that. It's it, it's it's pretty worthless. I would never buy that. Um, and then there's a custom death box for each different like uh, 
theme power source activation emote combo. And then when you get all of the items in one of the categories, you get a nitride version. And nitride is a... I don't know what it is. It's like this purple, like, glowy thing. I don't know. There's there's supposed to be some lore, but they, they haven't really thought of it yet. Like, quite literally. Like, in the blog where, where they explain this stuff, they say, considering the other five Qatars, the, the thing is called the Cobalt Qatar... Considering the other five Qatars have ties to the Outlands locations, Nitride is a curious choice, don't you think? That's all the lore. That's it. <laughs> the lore is we want more money. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, I, yeah, I the, like the, the idea, idea is... of the customization. Yeah. Except the monetization is probably disgusting. Yeah, so the idea is you can like mix and match all these things, and it, it's supposed to be like, oh, your your artifact is unique to you when, I mean, there's... So I guess if you do the math, there's like 200 combinations, but realistically, there's a lot less than that because like the some of them are very small differences, and also the activation emotes. If you if you take out the activation emotes and the death boxes, it's a lot less. Um, but yeah, I I was lucky enough to roll in a, to roll heirloom shards, so I did get a I did get my apex artifact. I have like no customization on it at the moment because I'm not I don't feel like spending much money on it. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. This was one of the big things that they advertised this season. So it was a little eh, especially because it doesn't really in interact with gameplay at all. Uh, and then the other major thing is they changed one of the maps. Uh, the map's called Broken Moon. Everybody really hated it, like really, really hated it because uh, the map was small. It had very few POIs and like they have these things called zip rails that go around the map. They're like really, really fast zip lines. You just, you just zoom all the way across the map in like a minute. People hmm. really hated it because it was just you're, you're always getting ran at by people. It's very annoying. <laughs> um, so they they kind of fixed the map. It's better. It's, it's not like fantastic, and it also doesn't help that the pub and ranked map rotation is honestly probably the worst one they possibly could have had. Like to the point where where somehow Broken Moon is the best map on it. Wait, uh, I, I don't it's a map what yeah yeah broken moon is a map wait there's a okay i guess i didn't think about because i don't play apex like i'm so used to like battle royale kind of games having one map wait can you you can yeah. select a map um so how it works there are five maps currently and oh. only three of them are in rotation at a time and it's like every for for unranked matches like every two hours the map will change and for ranks, the map just changes every day. So you can't actually select oh. the map. It's like a rotation. Is there a meta of just playing on certain days then because the map is ass? Um, kind of. Some people some people will skip the days where they don't like the map. Uh, but because of how the rank system works, where it's like you need to put in a lot of time to actually get get like your true rank, uh, most people just kind of play it through. <laughs> they, they suffer through the, the maps that they don't like. <laughs> oh, God. I, I, it's so funny that every time everything you describe in Apex just like translates in my head into Overwatch Two because it's the same garbage, yeah. it's like this, just the same slop in both games. The same old slop. <laughs> same old slop. Yeah. Uh, besides that, they actually changed surprisingly little. They uh, they did this typical thing where they like buff the crappy characters a little bit, but not in ways that are actually substantial. Like it's all it's mostly quality of life. And well, there actually is one thing that's kind of cool. So there's a character called Ash. And you can throw out like a snare, and when it hits somebody, it'll restrict their movement to like a small circle, basically. Like they're it's like a trap. And what they did is that she can previously, when she would take out her snare to throw it, she would have to put away her weapon. But now she can have her weapon out. And so the main strategy with the snare is you like snare somebody, then you spam nades on them. Uh, but now you can snare and throw grenades at the same time. <laughs> so what people oh. are doing is like on the exact same frame, they'll like snare and throw a grenade at somebody. You just kind of have to junk rat trap. <laughs> yeah, just... you just kind of have to eat it. It's really funny. Character isn't like still isn't great, but it's it's fun cheese for like unranked games against like mm -hmm. stupid people. Is anyone happy with the current patch? <laughs> so, uh... God, very complex <laughs> question. I, I think people were like fine with the game before, and they didn't act effectively. They didn't change very much. I guess the biggest change for like gameplay is they it's a new care package weapon. 
uh it's the devotion which is like the standard it's like the ramp up lmg and they god they gave it this really stupid mechanic where the longer you fire the tighter your hip fire spread gets huh that seems like it would be the opposite yeah it, it normally is the opposite but they gave it a unique mechanic for care package gun so uh, now people are just getting hip fire lasered by a devotion <laughs> like from really far away oh god and also the gun has like the highest dps in the game so yeah very so very, fun. very fun very cool care package weapon yeah but besides that the game's kind of kind of the same honestly the only <laughs> real difference, worse i guess the, the most <laughs> i guess one other major difference that they did is they um they bugged caustic who's been meta for a little while so now his uh his gas just slows teammates they didn't say it anywhere in the patch notes, it just does so people just kind of <laughs> stopped playing him oh so that's a that's a that's a win no more poison character in my games just make him bad easy fixed yeah oh my god very easy speaking about uh making things bad um so this isn't okay this isn't necessarily that true uh and it's too early to tell but i've been playing in my own personal time i've been playing mass effect Mm -hmm. and i just completed one i just completed two yesterday and I started three. Now, the first thing I'm going to say about two is I did a really dumb thing, but it wasn't my fault, and it kind of ruined some of my ending experience in that game. Oh, uh, yeah, that's the classic. No, but I didn't do it in the way you think. So I did every side quest in that game that I could. I did every mm-hmm. loyalty mission, and I everyone in my... Okay, spoilers for Mass Effect 2. That are, like I'm going to talk around it very vaguely, but... Um, my spoilers for kind of the end segments of Mass Effect 2. Um, mm-hmm. My whole crew is okay. <clears throat> Everyone is okay. So that's good. Um, so I, I didn't mess up that. I played the DLC first because I didn't realize both DLCs were DLC. So mm-hmm. I played both of them before doing the final missions of the game. And yeah. uh, are, you f- are, you, are you familiar with the Arrival DLC in Mass Effect 2? Yeah. Yeah, so the Arrival DLC is basically the prologue for Mass Effect 3. Um, Mm -hmm. But you can play it before beating Mass Effect 2. So you basically... uh, What I did was... uh, I was trying to do all the side quests before the end of the game. And I was like, oh, this is a side quest. So I did it. And big revelations happen in the the ending. There's a big moment in in the ending. And I'm going to talk around it. But um, let's just say some war crimes are committed, right? Yep. And um, there's a because you haven't beaten the game yet, a character is like, you committed war crimes, but we'll come back to this later. You got a mission to finish. It's like, <laughs> oh, they're literally just like, you know, you're going to have to go to court for this, right? That war crime. Um, But you didn't beat the final boss yet. So go back, to, go, go back to that. Um, None of this happened yet. Just don't don't worry about it. Yeah. And yeah, I was that like, was back oh. When op- yeah, that was back when like open world games didn't know how to do DLC. Yeah, they just you let just you do it at any time. Yeah, you just accidentally throw yourself into it. I mean, that's still kind of a problem, honestly. But like, less so. Yeah, but that one's one of the worst ones because it got me googling. Like, did I just mess up? Like, I didn't Google. So like, after playing, I was like, did I just play this in the wrong order? Does this affect anything? And then I basically got like minorly spoiled for other stuff. Because I was trying to determine if I should reload and replay like 40 minutes of gameplay because like I missed content. And I did miss content too because there's other dialogue that happens if you beat the game first. Mm -hmm. Um, It probably makes more sense. Uh, Anyway, Mass Effect 2 is really good. I think it's the best one so far. It's the best balance of the jank of 1 and 2. It just feels good. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, it's it's great. Then I booted up 3. I've played maybe an hour of three. What happened to that game? Like visually, why does it look worse than two? Like oh, what is it's weird? Like the HUD, like the UI is like baffling. And also they yeah. went back to like Mass Effect 1 kind of like level. Like they took things from Mass Effect 1 and brought them back. Like there's like weapon mods and there's like more skills and stuff. Like I'm like, what are they? It's it's kind of bizarre. Um I, I think it's way too soon to tell what i will think about the game but um yeah weird yeah so from what i understand mass effects we have the shortest development cycle Mm -hmm. so that might be part of it 
Uh, it was also so weird time in games because like Call of Duty and Battlefield were like blowing up. There was like, oh, you know, we got it, we got it, we got codify. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Lots of weird design decisions going around at the time. It's really weird because I think Mass Effect Two was literally perfect. Like they perfected all the systems for the most part, and it seems like mm-hmm. they're like taking some steps back in a way. Like they're stepping forward. Like everything seems way faster in three so far. Like everything is yeah. faster. Like movement and hiding and cover and everything it's a lot more streamlined and i i know i know as the games went on they became more and more like a shooter rather than like they move away from the rpg stuff um Mm -hmm. but it is giving off the energy of the like the harry potter movie for for, like here to hear me out with the harry potter movies Mm -hmm. uh where it's giving off like the first movies are like oh yeah you know slower paced or whatever. Then by the end, the last two movies are just action, and and like even the games for that series, they're just you're like firing wizard machine guns, and it's just way more action. And it's you're an end game now. Like now it's going to be all about fighting and like less slower. Um, but it's so what you're I don't know, saying. It's like whiplash. What you're saying is that it's turned into slop. No, I, okay, it's, it's sloppier. It's sloppier. Why did the HUD look? Why does the HUD look worse? Is my question. Like, I don't understand how, like, the wheels, it looks like it's the UI, right? I I think the UI in two is really pretty subtle and nice. Um, And I get what they're doing in this game. And I think some of the balance changes for, like, are are good, like, good changes. Yeah. But why does, like, the, the, the dialogue reticule thing, like, it looks worse i don't know it's like this it's it looks like that like ipod like design where everything yeah. was like um like everything was big shiny buttons and stuff like it's like way, way over designed yeah but, i so from what i remember mass effect 3 like it, it was just a weird ass game for the studio like i think it was between some people leaving uh like people disagreeing on where the game should go like i, I remember that like i think everybody remembers the ending controversy like i won't i won't spoil yeah. it but i don't I remember think, the ending but i remember there's yeah i think there was one point bad. where they like released a, a, like an alternative ending on a forum <laughs> like, it, it was very odd and like i think I, I was looking at it when i was playing mass effect one and i was like what the hell were they cooking <laughs> well, Mass Effect One really weird is, times for video games, man. It's Mass Effect One's kind of at. its own kind of slop, but in a good way. It's good slop. Yeah, two is perfection. Two is actually like a meal, and then three is a maybe meal. returning to slop. Yeah. Oh man. Um, it also just like I've seen like one cuts. I, maybe I need to acclimate to three, but I've seen like the intro cutscene, and the, the, also one there's like a child now. And there's just some weird, like it just feels off. Like the tone, yeah, the, the lore feels gets off. odd. It also, I don't envy Bioware for having to be like, okay, like when you start the game and import your character, it just shows you a list of actual choices that mattered, kind of. And it, it's like, how so much of this content might not ever be seen by a player, and they have to develop so much stuff that might not actually yeah. be seen. Like I don't envy that. Like, yeah, they're like not gonna, na- I, I don't being a narrative it. designer or writer on one of those games is probably like a nightmare. And every game is exponentially worse. Like by yeah. three, like I don't under, like it. It has the right to be a little bit slop, you know. Yeah, like I, I definitely don't blame them for like doing a whole new thing with with Andromeda. Like I, I would not want to make another yeah. game in that series. That that's supposed to be actual slop, so I'm excited to play that. Yeah. I bought that too when it was on sale. Yeah, I so. bought that one as well. I, I really need to like get back into playing Mass Effect. I like I wanna I wanna play more single player games, but every time I'm like every time I'm like, okay, you know, I'm kinda sick of my regular games, I'm gonna get to my single player games, then something new comes out or like some new game to play test, and I'm like, man. I, I just can't not play this. Hey, you know what just came out that I didn't play? And, I mean, that's my Mass Effect segment. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know more as I play. Um, but, you know what game just came out? DLC? Elden Ring DLC. I haven't played it. I, I don't think it's out yet, actually. I think it is out. Really? I think it literally came out, like, a couple days ago. I need to check. They released another I think no one... I think really, days. like, for some reason... Yeah, June 20th it came out. Well, it's May. Oh, wait a minute. I'm an idiot. Never mind. Scratch that from the record. Good. Never mind. Okay, good. We don't have to talk about it. Because I was like, oh, I'm being lazy. 
for some yeah, reason so, yeah so it comes out june 21st you can you can buy it already though it looks like yeah i already so for some reason i think i must have read that as it's like 39.99 um, yeah but it's gonna be thick i assume yeah that's a whole new game sheesh i, th- I think i read the release date as may a couple days ago and i'm like yeah uh, I should probably play the Elden Ring DLC, which I will enjoy, but I'm in the middle of Mass Effect. This actually is great news because now I don't now I can beat Mass Effect 3 and then go into Elden Ring. Yeah, I'm actually very be, conflicted like, on the Elden Ring, Ring DLC because I haven't finished the game yet, but I also haven't played it in like I th- it, it's been like a, a, over a year. So I'm at the point All where right. like, do I come back to my existing character or do I just start? No, over? <laughs> here's your homework. Start over. Yeah, yeah I, I, I was that. thinking that too. I, I, I feel like it it's really it. hard to hop back into a Souls game. Like yeah. it's one of those games you have to like play from beginning to end in like not not like one go, but like you can't take a huge break because like I'm there's so many debating... there's so many things going on that you'll like forget and you'll forget what you already did and you'll forget where you have to go. Yeah, I I have a really complete character, and I'm debating whether or not I should. Uh... Actually, by beating the game, I w- does that auto put you into New Game Plus? Because I might have to make a new character. I don't know, but but yeah, I, I remember. I remember like I, I had my build all figured out, but it was like I had like twenty tabs of the wiki open, and that yeah. was like on my like my old laptop, and I got rid of everything on that. So it's just <laughs> like, man, I don't want to like do that again. I like if I start over, I think I'm just gonna kind of go with the flow. Like I don't know if I'll do like anything too crazy for my build. Like you know, I'll, do, I'll probably um... like look up something every once in a while just for like to get my weapon and stuff and i won't like do crazy like optimization for all like the small things so i did all like a lot of the side quests and i did like the the ronnie one the witch like the 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 big side quest which is i would highly recommend you doing it because there's like a lot of content behind that side quest yeah um i I I don't know if i part of that i don't know if i would want to do that again like on a replay but it was like worth it to do it because there's so much stuff but it was a lot Um, so I lied about Elden Ring DLC because I'm dumb and read the date wrong. So scratch that. Man. Um, you know what? Because this is the extra long, cool podcast. I, I think we'll talk about this topic and then we'll do some questions. Um, so I am aware. I am now aware of the Chainsaw Man. He really is a Chainsaw Man. Yeah, it's a very, very apt name. <laughs> yeah. There, he's a man who uh there's chainsaws yeah all right what, anyway what am i some questions. sort of chainsaw man <laughs> no um so i watched chainsaw man season one i was like wow this is really entertaining um kind of weird vibes a lot of weird content in chainsaw man yep um the author I is think... a very very odd man yeah there's a lot of very thinly veiled fetishes in chainsaw yeah. man if you, very if you get thinly the chance, veiled. if you get the chance, you've got to read up on the author's lore. He's a he's oh, a very God. bizarre dude. Like not so, not even like like weird. So it's weird, but not like harmful weird. It's like he, he just has a lot of odd experiences. Like weird things just happen to him. But <laughs> and like it's to the point where I'm pretty sure that that Denji is like actually just based off of him, and like <laughs> all of his experiences are probably things that happen to him. Um. I like how the main character of Chainsaw Man, the Chainsaw Man, like you said, is just unapologetically an asshole who just kind of sucks. Like, he's just sucks, but it's kind of great. Like, he so, sucks in a way that's great because he so doesn't I, really, I, like, care. Yeah, I think the thing is he sucks, but it's like, it's because he literally had nobody to raise him. Yeah, well, it's not like he's maliciously, like, I mean, the funny thing is, yeah, yeah he just doesn't know right from wrong or anything. And it's yeah, not yeah, like, he has, like, no, no morals set up. He's just like act like on like base instinct of just like yeah um you know just like oh I want to do this um the show is great I really enjoyed it uh I I can tell why people were talking about it um the animation's mm-hmm. really kind of cool they use a lot of like CG 3D stuff but it looks yeah. pretty good um really dynamic camera angles and things yeah it's I, very I, cinematic see the problem is uh this is giving one Punch Man season one vibes, and that's so good. It's the, really good, really good. And then like when season two uh, not announced, there's also a movie not announced. It's like oh, okay. So in like yeah. seven years, maybe we'll get it. And it's like a different studio, and it's gonna be like ass. So so from so, what I understand, it's gonna be the same studio. It'll be a different director because so this was actually very interesting. Apparently, Japan really didn't like the anime because interesting. What I, so from what I'm getting, if you've ever read the manga, 
it, it is a very different vibe. The the art is very like sloppy, kind of like yes. intentionally so. Mm. Uh so the the anime being like very it, it it's it's like it's in it's in like 4K almost when like <laughs> it, it's like the anime is in 4K when the manga is in 360p and it's like split up into a bunch of different parts that you have to like find on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, like I I would encourage you if like if you have the chance to like read the manga and like Oh, I plan it, on reading it. Yeah, it. yeah it, it's a very I wouldn't say necessarily say it's a very different experience, but it's just like visually very unique. Well, um, also, I like the yeah. story, and I'm not going to get the story for, mm -hmm. like, ten years if I wait for yeah. the anime. So I yeah, might as definitely. well read it. Yeah, and um, um, so from what I've heard, they're, like, they've, they're getting a new director, and the art style is going to be different. They released, like, a teaser for the movie that, like, already looks quite different in art style. Um, so, yeah, they're just trying to do, like, a whole different thing. But it, it will definitely be the same studio. I think it's really cool that the movie is supposed to be like an arc from the manga and not just yeah. like a one-off random thing. That's kind of my problem with anime movies is like they're just a one-off doesn't really relate to the story at all. You could skip it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a new thing. Ever since like Demon Slayer did that with the with like the train arc every like every anime is doing it now where it's like, you know, you do the season one, then you do a movie. For yeah, like that, one of the arcs. that's perfect. Do an arc. Yeah. Um, I just don't get. Yeah, like the. The, like one piece has a ton of movies that like don't matter and people are like well yeah it's fun like there's a fun story it's like but yeah does anything matter it's like no it's like okay i'm not watching this yeah like, i think I it's care. very much like a it's more of like a long-running anime thing than a seasonal anime thing to have like this very like inconsequential movie because it's like you just want to see the characters like not in the same environment as they're always in it's like yeah, but it, so much of them in this environment. But it almost feels like it's like seeing your favorite character in a spin-off game. Like when I play Persona and then I play like Persona 5 uh the beat 'em up the Dynasty Warrior game, I can't remember the name. Um mm -hmm. when you play that game and it's like all the characters are here but they feel wrong. Or it's yeah. more like in also like the I don't know, like the fighting game or whatever. It's just they they the characters are here but they don't feel right. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I think Chainsaw Man is has some questionable content though. As like watching it as an adult compared to watching anime when you're like 13, um, in in regards to uh one character who's like un they're not aged, but they're probably like late 20s, early 30s who tries to sexually assault multiple minors as a joke, but then they're played off as yeah. like a hero because they're like a hot anime woman. Because they said so just like, kidding. Cool. No, it wasn't really just kidding. It was kind of like, oh man, I was really drunk. Uh, did I bang you? And he's like, no. And she's like, oh, I totally would have though. Oh man, can you help me bang your other friend who I groomed when he was underage? Now we're best friends. <laughs> you um, know, I, I think the really funny part is like the fandom is split into two where there's people that are like, oh, this is awesome. There's people like, oh, that's horrible. Yeah, the and, and I think like the weird thing is that it, and yeah, children. and I think the weird thing is that it keeps happening, and nobody is sure if the author is like. So, like the the people with like reading comprehension abilities <laughs> are like, you know, obviously he's saying this is bad, but then he just does it again, <laughs> and it's like so the people that that like the people that like don't understand that it's bad are like, see, he keeps doing it. He obviously thinks it's good. Uh, it. It's, it's very bizarre. Weird because the, it's the character that is played. There is no like that. No one really like is mad. The, the the only like record like the only backlash the character has is like jokingly saying like I could get sent to jail for sleeping with minors. Lol. Anyway, um, and and it's like what? And yeah. then um, and and then it's just like I don't know. It, it, I think it's just because. It's one, it's like anime boys and stuff, and it's just like hot anime girl, lady, anime yeah. woman. And it's like, oh, I wish, God, I wish that was me posters being like, you know what I mean? Like thirsty posters or whatever. Yeah, if it was much. the other way around, that's horrific. It's horrific either way, to be honest. Um, especially with the, she literally, like this character literally um, is like the mentor of this other child. And like is grooming him and now that he's like of age is like i want to hook up with this child you gotta have guy who i almost like sexually assaulted who said no and didn't want to 
uh, do this. Uh, you need to help me hook up with her, him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that took me out of it a bit because I was like, what is this? Like, what? <clears throat> like, this is this is terrible. This yeah. is a weird story <laughs> line. Yeah, I, much of the story is uh, basically just Denji being abused, tortured, taken advantage of, and not being aware of it. Yeah, but when you're that age, like when you're the age of the protagonist and you're reading it, which is probably the target demographic, you're probably like, oh man, like I wish that was me. Like literally, that's like, I think the vibe. Yeah. But when you have perspective on it, it's like, this is horrific. This is pretty yeah. bad. Like, it's quite interesting. It was like effectively two readings of it. Yeah. Um, and I, I won't spoil, but like uh, with like the part two that the creator is doing right now, he's like leaning more into the hey, I have actual reading comprehension and I'm an adult reading of it. And people are like, Where, where's the blood, the violence, the the, the sex? Mm -hmm. What happened? Good. That, that, that'll be cool. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. One Punch Man's kind of similar-ish. Not like with that content, but just like, all right, One Punch Man, he punches. It's like Chainsaw Man. He does the chainsaw for season one and then it like goes on and then it actually tells a, sto a more interesting story. <laughs> And I also You're telling feel me like, there's actually a human being behind the chainsaw? Well, what happens is I think this this show is also formatted in the same way where they have the Genos character who's Samurai Man, who I forget the name of. You know, like the guy who has the blade that's cursed and whatever. Like Oh, oh Aki. Yeah, he yeah. is like the straight man kind of character. And uh, he's the main character, basically. Like, like a Genos. But like our actual main character is like this like unkillable force that is basically just like a goof like you Our know actual main character is the guy who kicks him in the nuts for fun that's true um i really liked the character arc of um uh, I, I liked the uh the ball arc i'm just gonna leave it at that the ball arc was good it mm -hmm. really was like poetry it rhymed from season one or the beginning to the end the ball arc um I also liked how the concept of the characters are they need to be the most batshit crazy people to even have a chance. Like if you're if yeah. you're not stupid, you you can't survive. Like so it, it gives them an excuse to just have the most unhinged cast of characters. And it's pretty it's pretty great. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on Kobeni? Is that the knife girl? Yeah, the knife girl who screams all the time. I love the fact that the, her power is the more traumatized she is, the better, stronger she gets. It's really funny that, like, she, I mean, she starts and she's kind of, like, sucky or whatever. I mean, she, she, just ha she just has, like, performance anxiety. Like, apparently she was always pretty good, is what they said. It's like, she was skillful, yeah. but she was just, you know, like, bad under pressure. But it is really funny that her power is just, she keeps seeing horrific things. Which are traumatizing her more. And I'm assuming the character is based off of, I mean, like the Sundari kind of character, or whatever. There is also a real story about a Japanese um, girl who killed people with a kitchen knife in real life, which I'm assuming this character is maybe modeled after, which I think is a little not tasteful. Or maybe the person who did that was inspired by characters who are like the Sundari whatever characters in media. Um, I, so I think it's more just <laughs> everybody is really crazy and stupid. And she's like a semi nor meant to be a semi normal person who just keeps getting put in like really dumb scenarios. I don't think she's normal, dude. She is clearly cracked out of her. I mean, she started normal, but now she is like, well, I, I mean, to be fair crazy too. in like the whole like uh, hotel thing, I, I think everybody was losing. I think it would be pretty normal to lose your mind there. No, true. Uh, and she cracked under the pressure, but I think that mental breakdown is what made her survive. Like, because the other yeah. guy was too normal. The other guy who also had a mental breakdown was too normal. You know what I mean? So he died. Um, which is, <laughs> so I guess, the moral a spoiler, of the story but not is, really. If you're, if, you're having, if you're having a mental breakdown, just lean into it. Yeah, lean into it and you'll just survive. Keep going. Um, well, I'm excited to read it at some point because I there's no way I can wait for you know any of that animation stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is the Chainsaw Man, and uh, you know what? Let's just answer a few questions because we're doing questions. Sure. Uh, we're already at extra long pod, but um, 
If you have any questions, you can email us at hyeppodcast at gmail.com. That's hyeppodcast at gmail.com. I think you can also, if you're listening on Spotify, you can also answer uh, at the end of the episode. I have a thing where you can like put a question in too, which would be kind of cool. Ooh. Um, I'm not sure how that works, but it seems like it could be cool. Um, let me let me let me get you a question. Maybe we'll do like a like like four. We'll or something. I don't know. We'll we'll see how this sure. goes. Um, let me look through our archive of questions. Here, let's see. I feel like we always ask like really similar questions. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna ask you a question from my heart. Is there? Have you ever played like any MMOs? Like, is there any MMO you like, like, or I guess like, what was your first MMO? And like, has anyone um, ever actually gripped you in any way? I think my first MMO was technically RuneScape, but I didn't really mm-hmm. play it that much. It was just kind of like my brother played it on the computer, and when he would like get up to go somewhere, I just kind of play it too. Mm-hmm. Um. But I think the first MMO I really got into was Adventure Quest Worlds. Mm-hmm. I yeah, played that, that too. A... It was like the Flash browser game. Yeah, right? man, Adventure Quest was it was a cool game or a cool like series of games. I really like Dragon Fable as well. I think that was my favorite one. But that mm-hmm. wasn't an MMO. That was just an RPG. Um, you should. I feel like <laughs> with your like things that tickle your brain in gaming, I feel like you would actually really like Final Fantasy fourteen. Um. It's all yeah. well. I think it would be really hard to get through the main story quest and like the garbage, but the slot. I think yeah, if you got to raids and stuff, I bet you would actually really like it because it's all like rotations and stuff, like like um, cooldowns and rotations and things positioning and all that. I think it just I feel like it has elements that I think you would actually really enjoy in the gameplay element. You just have to get through the slop, mm-hmm. which is the main story quest, genuinely slop. Yeah, uh, but you have to read it. Like that's the thing; it's slop, but you need to read it and do everything so you can have context for what's going on. But it's yeah. just like it really is like a ninety-hour slog. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, it could be fun. I don't know. I I, I'm, I feel like I really fell off MMOs for the most part because there's nothing really right now that's like there's there's no real thing that piques my interest that much. Yeah, uh, in the space. Know. I'm not sure if I'm like a like an MMO gamer, I guess. Because I don't know, like uh, over time, l- like I-, I think Borderlands is the only game that I can really still like do the grind in. Like I, I, I kind of fell out of love with Diablo 4 really quickly and I have a friend who keeps trying to get me back into it every update. Um, And I'm just kind of like, nah, I don't, I don't really feel like I, I don't, I don't want to farm again. <laughs> I just don't, I just don't want to do it anymore. I like a, uh, I do like a farming. So weirdly enough, Castlevania Aria of Sorrow on Game Boy and some of the other Castlevania games have a weird farming mechanic in which there's like souls that enemies drop and there's like rare mm-hmm. drop rates and stuff. And I just like enjoyed farming for those. I don't know, like getting rare drops. Like Terraria has the same thing where like, yeah. I kind of like doing a repetitive task for like a one in 99% chance of getting like a super rare thing as long as I don't mm-hmm. have to pay for it. Like, I kind of do like getting rare things. Um, so I, I do enjoy grinding in, in certain games. Like, when, when I play like a JRPG, I kind of do enjoy grinding for like a rare weapon or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's just like, I think the 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 key gameplay of like a Final Fantasy fourteen being learning rotations doesn't appeal to me because I don't want to like just do the exact button combination over and over again. And if I'm bad, yeah. like get flamed by people. Um, I think there's a lot of pressure in that game to like perform well um, mm-hmm. with your teammates and stuff. But um, anyway, J- James, you want to hit a question up? Hit me with a question. Sure. All right. <laughs> there's just like all the same questions. Do you think Pac-Man gets tired of eating dots all day? What would he order I've... at a fast food restaurant? Is that a question we have? Yeah, yeah it's a question. All right, well, what's the most dot-like... I mean, dipping dots... The frozen treat is like a very dot-like experience. Okay, but but what if he gets tired of eating dots? All right, I'll, I'll answer that. This is a two-part question. I'm going to answer yeah. the food question first because I'm really thinking about it. All right, have you ever seen those bagels that are the middle part of the bagel? It has cream cheese in the middle. Yeah. I bet he would like that. That's a dot-type food. Um, a dot-like? I'm thinking of dot-likes. Yeah. Oh, um, 
There is the Italian rice, fried rice dessert, like arancini or something. Is how you say? I don't know. Whatever. It's like rice and like cheese and just fried and peas and stuff. Probably like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and other dot likes. But anyway, do you think he gets tired of eating pellets? I never really. So Pac-Man's weird, right? I guess he literally. So I was gonna say I never really thought of him like as actually eating them. Um, but then I'm thinking of Pac-Man World Two where he's a 3D model and is actually, like, I think, eating them. And then he does eat the ghosts, too, which is weird. Um, maybe he just... Maybe he doesn't have taste buds. Maybe he just kind of eats anything. Well, he eats fruit, though. Yeah, but, like, I, I assume, he, he just kind of does it by coincidence, no? I, well, I don't know. I think you want to go out of your way Because it's fruit. in the way. He's just an endless... Well, he's just an endless pit of, of, of hunger and... And raw greed. He doesn't, he doesn't I, care about. The I taste. guess. <laughs> I guess I imagine those, those like dots probably taste like communion wafer, just like nothing. And then that he's like, yeah. oh god, fruit, finally some sustenance. I don't know. I I like my head cannon. He just doesn't have taste buds, and he, the only thing on his mind is eat. He he just has to consume. I mean, but it's weird because there's two very distinct Pac-Mans. There's Pac-Man, the arcade game where he's like a concept. And then there's like just, gr- well, actually there's three Pac-Man. Then there's Pac-Man 2, the new adventures where he's like a grumpy working class stiff man from like the 50s mm-hmm. who's just those weird facial expressions. And then there's like Pac-Man world. And I guess there's like the new adventures of Pac-Man, whatever. There's just like nerdy, weird humanoid Pac-Man. Pac-Man's a character that really never got any like they really just couldn't make him work. You know what I mean? Like he yeah. like they they tried to make him a 3D mascot, but he's not that interesting. He's like kind of like he's like the worst parts of Sonic and the worst parts of Mario combined into a character. Yeah, it's a very like personality odd character, wise. Honestly. Yeah. I don't know. Um in all right, this is a weird question. I like this. Which video game world would have the worst internet connection, and how would the inhabitants complain about it? That's a Ooh. such a weird question. I feel like the Titanfall universe would have some ass internet. It's like if you think <laughs> about it, like there's people all across like the galaxy or universe or whatever, and there's like a bunch of like places that are just in in. Just, east ass honestly like (laughs) middle of nowhere and like it's to the point where like canonically in um in one of the like one of the characters in apex they literally can't get home because there aren't ships or or like communications that go that far so like that like imagine you just can't (laughs) you're so far you can never communicate with anybody you know i mean that's the problem with any space kind of game and they probably have yeah yeah but i think also like most space games have like solved that though or like they have like light speed travel or something like that Mm -hmm. well luckily we'll never have to worry about the uh titanfall ever again because i'm never making a new one oh actually very funny that you mentioned that because i just got a notification on twitter uh from from a account that does like i guess it's like a news account that okay that like occasionally does like respawn entertainment like leaks Apparently, they're looking for a director for a new multiplayer FPS experience. Hmm. Probably not Apex. Or probably not. Um. Whatever. You never know. Um. Yeah, I. That's a weird question because uh, I mean, your mind goes to immediately like, oh, last of like any apocalypse setting where they won't have internet. But I'm trying to think of like a world that would have internet, but like is annoying. Yeah. Um, I feel like Mass Effect, like there's some annoying things in Mass Effect. Like when you're walking around in game, like there's like radio interference and like there's a lot of like glitchy stuff in that game. And I I feel like it's basically what I think Earth, like regular Earth, would kind of be like in a space setting where it's just yeah, it's kind of the same, but just things are in space and they still kind of are shitty. It's just like you know, Mm -hmm. things are pretty much the same. Um, yep. I think I'll ask you one more question and then we'll call it a pod. Okay. If there was an Olympic event for video game characters, what bizarre sport would they invent and who would take home the gold? And you can't say Mario versus Sonic at the Olympic Games or an actual Ooh. like Olympic game. 
Oh, I think I locked I mean, one in. They definitely like. I I feel like all the characters like Master Chief and Doom and stuff like all the guys in the single player like shoot shooters that are about killing massive amounts of like aliens or demons. They just have a competition to see who could kill the most. I feel like but, yeah, they would that like switch. Right. They would like switch enemies. Like Master Chief would be like fighting the Doom demons. I think Doom guy wins no matter what though because he's just Doom guy. Yeah. But yeah, that'd be, I don't think that'd John be cool, Halo man. will yeah. win. Yeah, I, I definitely think Doom Guy would take home the gold. I really, yeah, I really don't think like that's his whole mo, you know. Yeah, is just killing a stupid amount. He's literally born for it. Whereas John Halo is just a guy. He's just John Halo from Netflix. He's just the guy who was in the right place at the right time. It, for, for like seven games. <laughs> <laughs> he 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 does it very RTS. often. He, he's in yeah. a lot of right places at a lot of right times. He, he's going to he, finish the fight. Honestly, he just has very high awareness of what's going on. And he has a very, he's, his clock is never, never slow. Um, I think mine for context would be Harry Potter 2 for the PS2 or GameCube. Uh, there is a thing introduced in the books in which they de-gnome the gardens in which there's little gnomes that can talk and are sentient creatures that literally can speak in English and talk. That they're like, oh, these are pests, and they just like horribly murder them and like throw them and like just like probably just like eviscerate them. And they're like, ha ha, we're wizards. They're like, yeah. I'm, I, they literally can like talk and are clearly like aware. And people are like, oh no, they're like rodents, and they just like, like destroy them horrifically. Anyway, Sounds terrible. It, in the uh, the game in Harry Potter 2, there's gnome throwing in which all the children pick up gnomes, spin them around, and throw them. Uh, see how far they can throw them and they just like throw them into like um, scarecrows and things um, so yeah I think I think that would be a competition just like throwing live creatures into wood chippers and stuff in the Harry Potter universe because mm -hmm. the mo most ethical Harry Potter uh, story um, yeah anyway I think it's time to finish the pod like John Halo would want us to do yeah this was a double decker pod. Uh, I've been Matt, aka Matt Fun Dude. You can find me on YouTube and Twitch. Uh, who are you? I've been James, aka James O Four E. You can find me on Twitch and YouTube and X. I'm Only also on X. X, but I don't really X. I don't really X anyone on X. I haven't Xed in a while. Oh, um, yeah, you can X X at me on X in my DMs, um, but I probably won't X you back. Or X you in a conversation. Um, yeah. Well, X. let's X out of this podcast. Goodbye. Bye.